Hey, Walter Sorrell's back with more tips for the knife maker. Today, uh, actually, we're going to be doing something a little bit different. It's an interview with me, uh, not a video that I produced myself at all. Um, this was uh, put together um, for the guys at Combat Abrasives who've been kind of friends of the channel and um, the uh, director of this video is uh, Chris Fiffy, who has a channel, Big Rig Videos. You can check them out on the, uh, in the description uh, down below. Anyway, um, basically just an interview with me, a little bit about you know, what makes me tick and why I do what I do. So I grew up mostly in Clemson, South Carolina, um, and you know I was a kind of nerdy, you know, military enthusiast. I like guns and knives, and and uh, you know, reading books about them. One of the most critical things that happened to me when I was a kid is that we moved to England when I was about 10 years old, and. So I went from Clemson, which was a town that had a history of about a hundred years at that point, to a town in England that had its own castle that was built in the, you know, 14th century, and you know the sense of history there was just, I mean, so different from any place that you would find in the United States. So you had this feeling that a knight in armor could come out from behind the corner at any moment, and history really felt alive. I, I was so interested in the military stuff and the knives and swords and armor and all that sort of thing that it sort of added up as part of my life in a way that it didn't when I was when I was living in the state. You know, ultimately, I think a lot of the things that I did as an adult kind of came out of that that realization that you're connected to everything and the things that you're interested in, you should pursue those things and, and try to try to feel your connection to the world. I actually couldn't tell you exactly how many novels I've written. Probably in the range of 30 and even so it kind of depends on how you want to do the math. I've written under my own name, I've written for kids, I've written pseudonymous stuff where, you know, under a fake name. I've written under other people's names. I've novelized, which means you're taking a script for a TV show and turning that into a novel. You name it, I've written it. You know, back before the internet, I mean, the amount of information that that was floating around out there about how to make knives was super thin. I mean, I basically bought every book in the English language about how to make knives. I would go to hammer ins and, you know, conferences and that sort of thing. I never apprenticed myself to anybody or anything like that, but, I, you know, I just, I'm kind of an information sponge sort of person, and so I just went out and I just sponged up every little piece of information that I could possibly find. What actually happened was that I was writing a book that had a character, I was going to have a character who was a um, swordsmith. And, you know, I've done Japanese martial arts for ages and ages. I've lived in Japan, uh, so I've been interested in that, that Japanese sword tradition for a long time. So here's this character, and I figured, well, let's try and just do something physical, essentially as a research thing, so that I could say, well, now I kind of have some feeling in my fingers of what this character would be going through. So I, uh, I actually got this little piece of steel about yay big, and I took a hammer and I heated it up with a burns matic torch and I hammered it on a rock. And so all I did was I squashed that thing by, you know, about a sixteenth of an inch. And I was like, this is so cool. I love this. And so I kind of went from that to trying to make a Japanese sword in one big leap. Terrible mistake. 
uh, you can't do it. Um, so, I mean, literally what I did is I bought this big old piece of steel and I cut out the shape of a Japanese sword with a jeweler saw. I mean, it took me like three days to do it. And I got done with that and I started, sh I shaped the entire thing with a file. And it, I mean, this whole process took me, you know, like a week or two. And I got done and I realized like, I have no idea what I'm doing. I absolutely have no idea what I'm doing. I got to back up, I got to try something different. And um, so what I did was I started working on Western style, you know, modern knives, just learning metallurgy, heat treating, just the really, really basic stuff. But I always had in mind, eventually I want to make Japanese swords. And so that, you know, evolution happened over the course of several years and at a certain point, then I started feeling like, okay, I now know enough that I can kind of start climbing the Japanese sword mountain. And that's, that's sort of uh, what took me there. My main thrust as a professional is Japanese swords. Uh, you know, I started out as a, as a Japanese martial artists. I did karate and later on a, a Japanese sword style. I've done Aikido. Um, and I, I was pretty deep into that before I ever made the first knife. And so I, I was really committed to that direction. I mean, literally from the, the first knife that I made, that's where I wanted to go. And that was the mountain that I wanted to climb. I'm not Japanese and, and at a certain point the Japanese tradition really requires that you spend an enormous amount of time studying that tradition. Apprenticing is a big thing and you know at a certain point I sort of felt like, hey look, I'm, I'm an American. This is always going to be an American guy making a certain type of, of blade. You know, I'm not trying to be a Japanese guy and I'm actually going to be starting to make some um, uh, production knives so I've started this uh, new venture tactics armory which is uh, devoted to tactical knives and you know it's a whole different way of making knives and so um, the the big challenge in front of me right now is kind of ramping up production moving to just a completely different model of making a, a blade The place that I always start in terms of knife design is how's it going to work? How's it going to function? Um, you know, I've been a martial artist for a lot longer than, than I've been a knife maker. And so I came into it with this sense of, you know, it needs to be bulletproof. Whether it's Japanese uh, style blades, the uh, tactical things that I'm working on right now, it, it, it's got to be right. The history of the Japanese sword, of course, is that this is a battle sword. It's a weapon that a warrior took into battle, and if it failed, they died. And so there's that's a real high bar of, of performance. And so that's where I start when I'm trying to work on a knife is this thing's got to work. It's got to be for real. Anybody that says, oh, it starts with the, the picture, in other words, the sort of visual, they're just, they're, it, that's bass backwards. You gotta start with function and then evolve the beauty or the badassness or whatever quality is that you want this thing to embody. That's gotta, that's gonna evolve into it. I think every knife maker just starts with their personality, whatever it is. If you start, by saying, what can I do that's unique or interesting? It's probably the wrong question to ask. The question should be, what am I into? What do I enjoy? You know, what kind of knife would I, if I had a million dollars to just go out and buy knives, what would those knives look like? Well, go out and make those knives. And so my approach has always been driven by my interest, interest in martial arts. So I shoot a couple of, uh, of shooting matches a week and I hang out with a lot of guys who are interested in self-defense and all this. So that little world is what leads me to particular knife designs. And so I would say anybody who's interested in making knives, what do you what do you want a knife for? Are you a hunter? Are you a martial artist? Are you just a guy who likes cool looking knives? Start with that and then see where it leads you. A 
about 10 years ago, when I first started kind of coming into a little bit of prominence as a Japanese sword guy, I got a lot of people asking me how I made hamones. You know, the hamone is this little squiggly line that's kind of the demarcation between the hardened and the softened part of the blade in a Japanese uh, sword. So I thought, well, I'll make a movie about that. And uh, so I got a little uh, video camera. Yeah, I got into it, you know, and that just led me uh, progressively towards videos about other aspects of Japanese sword making. YouTube just keeps teaching you things, and what YouTube taught me was that there was actually, you know, a, an appetite for those kinds of videos, do-it-yourself type videos. It was totally separate from people who wanted to buy my knives. So I just kind of kept going off in that direction. My philosophy in terms of doing these videos was show everything, make the audio clear, you know, let people see what you're doing. And if you can do that, then they're going to be interested in it. And, and, you know, it just worked out. So I just, I try to do the best videos that I'm capable of producing. One of the most gratifying parts of the YouTube thing is that I have all these people contacting me and saying, you know, you got me started doing this thing. Um, you know, I, I hear from people who've uh, been disabled, uh, you know, veterans and, you know, people who are on disability and they've been depressed and they had, you know, they found this this thing, you know, making knives and, and you know, the, the fact that I've been able to contribute to helping people have happier lives is, you know, that's not why I, I started doing this, it, but it's an incredible, uh, add on, you know, it just every time you get a, a note from somebody like this, it's like, wow, that's, I, I, I really feel fortunate to have been able to do that. I'd say the best place to start with knife making is just to make something fairly small and fairly simple. You know, a hunting knife, um, just simple kind of things that you would use because actually one of the most important parts of knife making is that you want to test everything out that you make. So make something nice and simple that you can uh, test and see what's wrong with it because it's not going to be perfect and then you just keep moving on to more complicated stuff. Almost everybody has in mind Excalibur, you know, that perfect knife or some, you know, a Japanese sword, a katana, you know, something really ambitious. That's how I started and it was an immediate failure. So you just, you know, shoot for the moon. That's great. I understand that impulse, but realize that you can't start out by um, flying to the moon. You just, you, you know, get, be the right brothers. Just get the airplane off the ground four feet. That's where you got to start and the moon's come that's going to come later. The reality is everybody starts from a position of huge ignorance. And so the, the solution to ignorance is to just jump in with enthusiasm and just try and soak up as much knowledge as you can. Just jump in, fail, make another one, fail, make another one. You know, it's one of those uh, six times down, seven times up type things. You just gotta fail and keep a smile on your face and keep, keep at it. Well, one of the things that I've always tried to do in my YouTube videos is to give a range of possibilities in terms of the tools that you use. There are a few things that you have to have machines for, but there are a lot of things in knife making that if you're just willing to expend the energy, you can make them absolutely 100% as well with the simplest hand tools as you could with really uh, fancy and expensive uh, you know, mechanical tools. The difference is just time and how much your fingers bleed. <laughs> Abrasives are actually one of the biggest expenses that knife makers have. Once you commit yourself to having some grinding tools, you got to have those abrasive materials and it's really critical that they do the job for you. 
And for me, I'm still finding out new things about abrasives because abrasives, uh, the abrasive industry changes, there are new products that come out all the time. Maverick Combat, um, they, they've got some really, some really cool um, types of, of abrasives that have helped me out a lot. So the standard kind of thing that you do with all abrasives is you start with a heavy grip and then you work up to finer and finer grip. And there's no place that you just are necessarily going to land. Sometimes you're going to finish up with hand work, you're going to be using sandpaper and doing a lot of things with your fingertips. Um, you may use stones, I use a lot of stones in my Japanese work. Uh, the place that almost all knife makers are going to start is that you're going to use uh, very heavy 40 to 60 grit abrasives um, on the grinding belt to rough out the basic shape of whatever it is that you're making. And so the better, especially that those low grit, 40, 60, 120, maybe even 220 grit, the, the more that those belts hold up, the more durable that they are, um, it helps you work faster, it helps you work uh, more quickly, more accurately. So those belts are really, really critical in it. And if you don't get those belts right, you can just waste an enormous amount of time. Two main things that I think knife makers are going to notice in terms of the belts that they use. One's durability. Uh, if you buy really cheap or crummy uh, belts, they just don't last very long. So it can be sort of a penny wise, pound foolish sort of thing that you buy cheap belts and then you can only make about half a knife and then you've got to move on to another belt. So the durable belt is a, is a really important thing and my experience with, with combat uh, belts is that they really last. A second point is that belts will bump a little bit on the platen as they come around there's a, there's a little joint and the heavier, thicker that that joint is, the more that that belt bounces and bumps your work. And it can really, if it's bad, it can actually make you lose control and mess up the work. So um, the belts that have a, a nice smooth joint really are a lot more pleasant to work with and, and uh, combat uh, belts are, are good in that respect. Right now, the thing that I'm really focusing on is the tactics armory thing. So my intention over the course of the next year is to really grow that into a, a business that's not just me standing in front of a belt grinder, that I have employees working on things that, um, you know, I'm going to be computerizing some of the aspects that I do by hand now. Um, so the idea is to be able to scale up my skill set and, and, you know, produce a, a much larger number of knives of equally high quality. So ultimately, what I would like to do is grow, you know, what I do into something much of a much larger scale, you know, into a company. So I, I'd like to be leading a, a nice-sized little knife company uh, in ten years.